today what I want to talk about is how to find the slip and slip orientation on faults when you're given information about the orientation of offset beds. So if you are using Marshak and Mitra in your classes, you can find steps on how to do this on pages 120 to 122. Um, but we're gonna we're going to try to visualize the problem first before we carry out those steps. So part one of this video is going to be visualizing the problem with Play-Doh. Part two of the video will be actually correlating those steps to what happens on a stereo net. So here's the information we're given. Um, a fault slip striking north 5 east is exposed on an eroded flat plane. So just real quick, I'm going to sketch my eroded flat plane. I'm going to make north straight in, in front of that plane and north 5 east means my fault is hitting the surface, something like that, not that um, intense. On an eroded flat plane, the fault has a dip of 30 degrees to the east. So my fault's kind of shallow coming off to the east. The outcrop positions of a dike striking north 50 west and dipping 75 degrees to the northeast and a sandstone unit dip, uh, striking south 70 east, 45 south are known on both sides of the fault. So we care about the outcrop positions because we can assume that that fault is going to have offset both of these units on either side. So for example, um, we say the the dike on the west side of the fault is at 500 meters, on the east side of the fault is at 400 meters, the sandstone is at 0 and 250. So I'm going to start with the sandstone unit because it's going to be easiest for me to, to give myself a starting point of 0. So on the west side of the fault, I've got a sandstone unit that's striking 70, south 70 east, so something like that, and I'm going to give it a zero position. Then on the east side, it's 250. And then my dike on the west side was 500 and 400 on the east side. So maybe 400 is about right here. And it was supposed to be striking north 50 west, which is kind of like that. And Let's see, 500 might be about there. So this is kind of weird. This might feel kind of weird because you have um, units closer together on one side of the fault than you do on the other. So the, a good first thing to do is draw this in map view. So in this space down there, I should have put space here instead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and draw this. So I'm going to give myself a starting point. And I'm going to call my starting point B because it's going to be my sand, where my sandstone unit hits my fault. And I know that my fault is striking north 5 east, so it's going to be coming down something like this. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in. Okay, and now I need to give myself a scale. So I'm going to do two centimeters to, um, let's see, let's not do two centimeters. Let's do one centimeter. One centimeter is 100 meters. And we're going to say that north is straight up. So I'm going to add that over here. North is straight up on my paper. All right, if B is at zero along this fault, then I can go ahead and draw in B prime. 250 meters would put me two and a half centimeters to the south of B. So this is my B prime point. And then A prime is 400, which is going to be 4 centimeters. And 
A is at 500, which is 5 centimeters. So all of these are points along the fault in map view, looking down from above. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw in um, just the surface expression of the strike of those units. So the, the dike was north 50 west, and it was associated with the A's. So let's see. North 50 west is going to be something over there. Gonna make sure it's horizontal. North 50 west is over this way. And let's make sure I got that on the right side. Yep. My west side of my fault was at 500, and north 50 west, coming from this side. Okay, so this is the west expression, west side expression of the dike, and here's the east side expression of the dike. Notice those lines are parallel, or at least they should be. I'm going pretty quick on this. All right, B prime is going to be 250. It's the sandstone, so it needs to go south 20 east. So south, or sorry, south 70 east. South 70 east is over here. I forgot which one I measured from. That's what happens when an email comes in while you're on a video. South 70 East. And B prime was on the east side. Good. South 70 East. And this needs to go up and onto the west side. Okay, so here I've got my B prime, and I'm just going to go ahead and label this the sandstone. Sandstone A prime is associated with the dike, and this side is also associated with the dike. So that's my map view. And okay, when you're in intro and you learn about fault offset, you might have learned about strike slip faults. I could almost bet you money that somebody showed you a picture of an offset fence, right? And maybe um, in that picture of the offset fence, it looked like this, right? They said, well, you can, you can figure out how far slip has, has occurred or what the displacement would be by looking for those piercing points and measuring the distance between the two. The idea of this is that if you had another fence right up here, you would have expected that same amount of offset. And if you had a fence down here, you would have expected the same amount of offset, right? Everything would have been going the same way. So for me, when I was a student, what was most confusing about seeing an, an image like this is that it looks like this dike has a left lateral sense of motion and it looks like the sandstone unit has a right lateral sense of motion and that feels really wrong. <laughs> so what I want to do is work this out with some Play-Doh and talk through how you get this map pattern um, because a lot of the reason why you get this map pattern is erosion. And we don't typically think about erosion or get taught about how erosion would change our problem when we're in intro. But now to help us visualize this problem, um, I've just rewritten some details about the problem. We're going to work this out with Play-Doh to get a good visual. So the first thing I'm going to do is make my sandstone unit. I'm going to start with a, uh, a little piece of Play-Doh and I'm going to go ahead and flatten it out. Okay, so I've got a nice flat piece of Play-Doh. And then I'm going to put some rock on either side of it. 
that. So just make my kind of hamburger of this. And you can trim off some of your excess Play-Doh sandstone if you want. You just want it to be a pretty thin unit so you can get a good visual on the strike and dip. Also, don't do this on a paper that you're attached to because you will get Play-Doh all over it. Okay, so our sandstone unit is striking south, 70 east, and it's dipping 45 degrees to the south. So it's kind of dipping toward us. Um, because, And the reason why it's dipping toward us is let's remember, I'm just going to write over here so that we keep this in mind, on our paper, north is in this direction. So this is east. This is west, and down here is south. Okay, so we're dipping to the south, striking north 70 east. So this would be north 90 east, north 70 east might be something like this. Now, we also have a dike, and our dike is striking north 50 west, and is dipping 75 degrees to the northeast. So I'm going to cut my sandstone unit so that I can put my dike in there. So take some dental floss and I'm going to go north 50 west and I'm going to cut this 75 degrees. So pretty steep and all of what I'm doing right now is an estimation just to help me visualize this problem before I go work this out on a stereo net. So I've cut my sandstone unit. I'm going to lift off this half try to be careful to take that off carefully and I'm going to lay my dike unit right on that plane and I'm going to replace my sandstone unit. You want to make sure when you replace your sandstone unit uh, that you're not inducing any displacement. So you can lift it up and just make sure that your orange unit is tracing uh, right all the way across without giving any offset in either direction. You want to make sure you're not making your dike a fault. Okay, so I've got my, got my hamburger situation, my geology hamburger set up, and now I want to put my fault in here. My fault, which I'm also going to cut with dental floss, was striking north 5 east and was dipping pretty shallowly off to the east. So I'm going to start over here, and this is going to be the hard part is dipping shallow because it's hard to cut shallowly with dental floss but you can kind of hold it with both hands on this side and then pull shallowly down okay so now oh man kind of cut a weird looking plane in there sorry guys try this again might have to cut it a little bit more steep than what I what I want to, just so I get a good visual of what might be going on. Okay. That's better. Alright, so now I've got my fault plane. If I lift this piece up, this right here is my is my fault plane. Uh, losing little bits. Okay, so my this is my west block, this is my east fault block, this is my hanging wall, this is my foot wall. Okay, so if I move down, if my hanging wall moves down, then let's see what that map pattern might look like. Okay. If my hanging wall moves down, then these move to the outside of what what those surface breaking units are on the west. And it looks like it's not, but it's just the Play-Doh coming apart. If I push that Play-Doh back together, these two are narrowing toward each other. Okay, narrowing toward each other. But these two are also narrowing toward each other, but almost like at a different rate than what they're doing over here. So as this comes down, these are going to look like they're getting farther and farther apart relative to what's happening on this west side of the fault. 
No. If the hanging wall moves down, then the east side units are farther apart than the west side units. Let's go back and look at our problem. Over here, we said that the east side units were more closer together than the west side units. So that's not what's happening. We don't have a hanging wall moving down, so we're, we're definitely not making a normal fault here. So let's try if we can see if we can move this hanging wall block so that these are closer together than this other side, than the, than the west side. Okay, I'm going to move this back up. And as I move up, if I'm thinking about the difference between these two, these two units, now comparing to this side, they're going to be closer together. So I can move pretty far up here and get these two units much more closer, close together than what they are on this other side. Okay, and if you peek, if we kind of peek under here, you can see, you can start to see this unit, my pencil, this unit is starting to tuck in relative to this one, and this has certainly moved in relative to this unit. Okay, so let's go ahead and make that flat erosional plane based on our observation that if we move this hanging wall block up, we get an, an eastern side, an eastern fault block, where these units have moved in relative to their old positions on the west side. So I've got the orientation I want. Now I'm going to go ahead and cut that horizontal plane. Lift that off. Okay, so now if I look at my horizontal plane that I've, I've eroded off from above, I don't have a ton of motion. I should have a little bit. It's just, it's, it's cut off. It's the Play-Doh that's causing a problem. This has moved in relative to this orange unit. So this inside corner is related to this inside corner and this you can see really nicely over here this corner would have originally tagged up with that corner okay so that's how we get that sense of motion where these two units have come closer together relative to those those units on the west side okay so typically in a problem like this your professor might ask you to find the attitudes of the trace of the sandstone bed and the dike on the fault plane. Here's what they mean by that. I'm going to peel off my hanging wall. Okay. What that means is what is the, the um, attitude, the trend and plunge of this dike, and what is the attitude of this sandstone bed. So this was my strike of my fault. My fault is striking nearly north-south and so I might have a trend and plunge if I rotate this back. I might have a trend that is um, you know, east and a plunge that's to the uh, a plunge around maybe 30 or 40 degrees. Same thing over here coming down this way. Okay, so they're asking for what is the trend and plunge of those, um, those expressions. The other thing they might ask is for the rakes of, of these. And when they ask for that, what they're trying to get you to do is look at the strike and compare the acute angle of that, uh, that line, that dike on the surface, the angle, the acute angle it makes with strike, and same thing for the sandstone unit. Sorry. The acute angle that the dike makes with strike, and the acute angle that the sandstone unit makes with strike. That's what we mean by rake. Um, rake also has an orientation because this line is coming down in some direction. So you're going to have that angle, and then you'd have down to the east. Okay. Now, another part of a, a problem like this is 
that they're going to ask you to draw a section parallel to the fault plane and it usually has the same scale as whatever drawing you start with. Let me make it clear what, what we actually want you to do. We want to see both sides of this fault plane but kind of in one picture. Okay, So think of it like the middle area of a Venn diagram that's containing the things that are on both sides. So for y'all, it's going to be that original uh, distance that's on this side of the fault plane, and it's also going to be this closer distance on this side of the fault plane, but just in one drawing. So imagine these stacked on top of each other, stacked on top of each other like that. Okay, so that drawing is going to look something like a kind of a give yourself a projection plane to work with. And we're going to say that we've got this expression of the dike and of the sandstone unit. And we'll have another expression of this dike and of the sandstone unit. So these two are both sandstone units and these two are both dikes. But this is what we're seeing through from this foot wall. And this is what we're seeing through from the hanging wall. So we're getting both sides of what's happening on that fault plane projecting into one plane. And that way we can kind of look at the difference in offset between these two. Now as you uh, start to think about that full difference, what that offset might be, the way that we do that, we'll just talk about this conceptually, is to think about where these might intersect. So I think I actually have this upside down. No? I think the Play-Doh is just very distorted. But there's some intersection point right here, and there's some intersection point here, and the distance that that intersection has moved and the direction that that intersection has moved indicates the full direction that the fault has moved this and the amount, the slip. So here I find my intersection and this is my intersection on, for this example, the west side of the fault, or sorry, the east side of the fault because it's hanging wall. And this is my intersection point on the west side of the fault or on the foot wall. So here I can see my east side has moved up relative to my west side and I could measure this amount and get the amount of slip my faults accumulated and I can measure this orientation and determine what orientation here the way I've sketched it it looks primarily to be a dip slip fault but we won't know that until we draw this all to scale so in part two of this video we're gonna we'll refer back to this conceptual drawing but we'll go ahead and do uh, the whole process on the stereo net also thanks